Almaty Taldikorgan Speedway is considered the main transport artery of the Jetissu. It connects the southern capital not only with the regional center, but is also a section of the highway connecting the southern and eastern parts of Kazakhstan. In summer, during high tourist season, the highway is packed. The name of the city of Taldikorgan can be translated as the Willow Mound, or a place with many willows and mounds. The floodplain of the Karatal River, on the banks of which the city is built, is indeed covered with dense willow thickets, as well as numerous mounds which can be observed from the highway. The village of Taldikorgan received the city status in 1944. From 1967 until 2001, the city was the administrative center of Taldikorgan region, and after the merge of two regions in 2001, it became the capital of Almaty region. The Outdoor World Expedition starts from Taldikorgan. With a group of archaeologists, we will take part in a survey of ancient mounds, will cross the desert in search of a thermal lake, and then join a group of jeepers from the nomad explorer community. Our itinerary is promising to be interesting and intense. This is the Arkali Pass, which got its name due to the abundance of Argali that had once lived here. On the highway side, we noticed a group of travelers with tents and backpacks. Their faces seemed familiar, so we decided to make a short stop. Arman and I have just met a group of volunteers from the Path to Abai project that they wrote about in the newspapers. The guys are traveling on foot from Almaty to Abai Kunanbayule's homeland. It's great that we bumped into them. Let's go and talk to them. There is a book called The Path of Abai, and our project is called The Path to Abai. Its idea is to walk from Almaty to the village of Jidebai, where the great Abai Kunanbayuli is buried. We walk, live in tents, and eat simple food. Sometimes they invite us to roadside cafes and treat us with food and tea. It's great. Damir, you've been on the road for five days. Are you still in high spirits? No thoughts of turning back? No way. It's getting more interesting every passing day. It's like doing sports. The first 100 kilometers were the hardest. Now our muscles got used to it, and the backpacks seem not as heavy. Seeing how many people are supporting us, we have no right to give up. Philosopher and enlightener Abai Kunanbayuli did a lot for developing the Kazakh literature and bringing it closer to world classics. Abai not only wrote poems, essays, short stories and novels, but also translated foreign authors into Kazakh. For example, Goethe's poem turned into a popular folk song, Mountain Peaks Sleep in the Dark of Night. Mikhail Yurievich Lermontov translated it into Russian. Above all summits, it is calm. This song has become an anthem for many generations of travelers. Damir, I don't even know what to call you. Travelers, tourists or pilgrims, can you share some interesting moments of your journey? Maybe some tourist sites that you have seen. For sure, walking you see much more than these of us passing by in vehicles. 
We consider ourselves travelers because we are walking our path to Abai. As to interesting places, of course, when you walk, you see the nature, beautiful dawns and sunsets. We are saying goodbye to the volunteers and continue our journey to Taldekwagan. Arman, it looks like we are already approaching Taldi Kogan. What would you recommend? It all depends on what you get, heads or tails. If you get a heads, I will invite you to a wonderful restaurant in the city center. And if, as always, you get a tails, I will invite you to this roadside cafe. Along the highway, there's no shortage of cafes and restaurants for any taste and any wallet size. We go for a budget-friendly option. Altogether, Lagman and Shashlik costed us two and a half dollars. Cafe personnel are hospitable and communicative. They recognized us and proposed to take a picture with us. This is the Almaty Oskemen Highway. Its construction is almost complete up to Taldekwagan. The remaining sections are still under construction. You can see cars riding along it in some places. Not every type of vehicle will be able to withstand the bypass road. But on the roads of Kazakhstan, drivers by tradition help each other if necessary. From the ancient time, this collecting driving altruism has helped travelers cope with the vast distances of the Great Steppe. Of course, building a modern motorway is more difficult than laying a country road in the steppe. How many layers of asphalt are there? When the construction is complete, tourism in Almaty region will receive a new impetus. Almaty residents will be able to easily get to eastern Kazakhstan and even Lake Alakol. Now the way to Alakon takes anywhere from 7 to 10 hours. After this road is finished, it will not take more than 5 or 6 hours to reach almost any tourist site in Almaty region. So we passed by the city of Tante Kogan and had a bite. Aman, you go on local expeditions often. What would you recommend seeing in Taldekorgan vicinity? Since you and I are nature lovers, I would advise visiting the Kora River and the Bulkan Bulak waterfall, not far from the city. These are truly amazing places that everyone should go to. Also, not far from Taldekorgan, an archaeological expedition is researching an absolutely unique monument for these ends, belonging to the Pazirik culture. The Pazirik archaeological culture of the early Iron Age got its name from five large barrows found in the Pazirik mountain area in the Altai Mountains. In 1865, a famous Tukologist, academician Rudlov, excavated a necropolis in the Burel River Valley on the territory of the current Katon Karagai National Park. The people of the Pazirik culture were mainly engaged in nomadic cattle breeding. The leaders of tribal associations were buried in wooden cribs. On top of them, they erected stone mounds. Thanks to the cool climate, the mummies found in the burial complex were well preserved. 
Their skin is covered with complicated pattern tattoos. Also in the burials, they found the remains of horses and golden jewelry. Until now, all discoveries related to the Pazuri culture were made in the southern Altai. But last year, a mound excavation 150 kilometers away from Taldekwagan became a real small revolution in archaeology. We should meet the archaeologists in the village of Jansugirov. Jansugirov village is the administrative center of Aksu district of Almaty region. It was named after Ilyas Jansugirov, a classic of the Kazakh literature and a prominent Soviet statesman. He was the first chairperson of the Union of Writers of Kazakhstan and a member of the Central Executive Committee of the Communist Party of the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic. In 1937, based on false accusations, Ilyas Jansugirov was arrested and executed. Now the village bearing his name has about 8,000 residents. There's a large sugar factory. The fields around it are covered with sugar beets and grain crops. The district center is located on the banks of the Aksu River. The cluster of Iron Age mounds was found near the river's exit to the foothill plain, near the Aksu hydropower plant. This is yet another evidence proving the well-known fact that, as today, in antiquity, water represented the most important life-supporting resource. Meanwhile, we have met the archaeologists and decided to set up an improvised dinner. Bon appétit, dear gentlemen. The excavation site is located a few kilometers away from the village. The works usually begin early in the morning. As a result of exploration, we detected a rather unique burial site. It occupied the entire alluvial cone of the Aksu River. It extends from the gorge source down to the furthest Arek. Along the highway, we saw hundreds of mounds. So what is so unique about this group? During the exploration, archaeologists identified several Pazirik type monuments here in Almaty region. This specific site was chosen for actual excavation due to several reasons. First of all, it's located next to the road and there is a possibility of setting up an open air museum here. Secondly, a lot of petroglyphs, which are also connected with a burial, were found on the nearby hills. Perhaps in a couple of years, this place will turn into a popular tourist location. Monuments of the Pazari culture were found in eastern Kazakhstan a long time ago. The question that intrigued everybody was where did these tribes go further? And what was their history? And then in 2019, for the first time in Almaty region, we discovered this Pazari monument on the territory of Jetisu. As in nature, everything in history flows and changes. Archaeological cultures, tribal unions, state entities, civilizations and ethnic groups collide with each other and constantly evolve. The Pazari culture was supposedly formed as a result of the evolution of the Afanasyev culture that occupied the southern part of Siberia in the Bronze Age.
Traditionally, in archaeology, Jete Su is represented by the early Iron Age Saka type monuments. They are quite different. Although they are dated from the early Iron Age, they represent a completely different culture and thus a different people. This is probably the first archaeological confirmation of large scale migrations of nomadic tribes from the east recorded in Chinese written sources. I hope this find will be a sensation and that it will benefit the archaeological study of not only Kazakhstan but also of the region as a whole. All three waves of the great transmigration of peoples at the turn of historical eras went from east to west. Potentially, the Pazirik tribes also came from the east and played an important role in the formation of the Usun state that emerged at the end of the first millennium BC on the territory of Jetisu. Based on the available data, we can say that the appearance of monuments of this type in Jetisu is associated with very serious military and political upheavals that took place in Central Asia in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC. This is the time of the formation of the huge Hunnic Empire that pushed many Sayan, Altai and Mongolian nomadic peoples further and further to the west. Without direct written sources, archaeologists can classify a monument based on cultural analogy. Each archaeological culture has its own features of funeral rites, weapons, clothes, as well as its own symbols. Each clan had its own family sign or tamga. This monument is a complex. In addition to a huge number, over 80 of mounds, we found petroglyphs and, most importantly, tamgars. To date, three different tamgars were discovered. What does it tell us? It points to the actual territory of tribal resettlement. Perhaps it will demonstrate kinship connections among nomads. The connections that stretched from the Danube to Manchuria. Archaeologists are studying antiquities not only for the sake of the academic science. Historical monuments make Jetisu more attractive for tourists, which means better economy for remote areas. The Cultural Heritage Protection Center was established in 2009 according to the enactment of the head of Almaty region. The center has 12 employees, mainly working in the archaeology department. There are four people there. Three more work in the architecture department. Our tasks are to protect study and keep records of the archaeological sites in Amatsi region, as well as engage in awareness-raising efforts. Region and national level organizations render special attention to the preservation of historical monuments. We are currently working at the archaeological sites of the Pazirik culture discovered in 2018. We have launched several new designated projects. In the future, we plan to set up an open-air archaeological museum here. The site is only 300 meters away from the highway near the village of Jansugirov and is quite promising since people are using this way to get to Lake Alakol. They use the same road to get from eastern Kazakhstan to Lake Balkash. We expect the number of tourists to increase after the completion of road works. Uh, 
At least some historical sites have good chances of becoming attractive elements of the largest tourist cluster, including logistics, hotel business and catering. Going on a trip to Jatessou, a potential tourist wants to learn as much as possible about the area, this nature, see wild animals, dive into the region's history, feel the ethnic flavor, but at the same time, not forget about comfort. The UNESCO World Heritage List includes four sites in Amati region. Tamgali was listed in 2013. Three more archaeological sites, Koilik, Karame again and Talgar in 2014. Over 5,000 petroglyphs were found in Tamgali, plus additional 100 archaeological sites also discovered there. Every year the interest to them among foreign tourists is growing. Just recently, more than 20,000 people went to these locations, including 7,000 tourists from abroad. Talgar is only 25 kilometers from Amati. It is an ancient city on the Great Silk Way. One route from it leads to the city of Jharkhand, another one via Lake Alakol to China. The settlement of Koilig, dated from 12th, 13th centuries, is another our site on the Silk Way. In 2013, they found a Muslim bath and a temple there. The settlement of Karame again is located on the way to Lake Balkash. Without a special tour, the impressions of the historical monument would not be complete. If there is a burial site, it means that people lived somewhere nearby. So our task now is to locate the settlement and other traces of their presence in this area. Petroglyphs, for example. This is what we are searching for now. The Aksu River had cut a canyon in the slopes of the Jatessu Ridge. Once herds of ibexes grazed among these rocks. Unfortunately, the economic development of the foothills drove wild animals into more deserted corners of the mountains. Nevertheless, we will try finding at least some traces of their former inhabitants. Since hunting played a significant role in the life of the ancient Jatessou population, images of wild animals are quite often among the bronze and early Iron Age rock paintings. Arman, come here. What is it? A deer or a tamga? We saw exactly the same one earlier. All of them are rail shaped and are accompanied by dots and dashes. What is your take on it? So in total we have two L-shaped tamgas here. The tamga down below represented a deer with a dot, and here we have another L-shaped tamga with two dots and a line. Behind the rock we saw many dots in the grotto and another L-shaped tamga. Maxime, look, it might be a good story for your next episode. It is more complicated than a standard clan tamga. 
And there's a Y here also. No, it's an E with two dashes. No, there are three of them, like a com. Initially, the Turkic word Tamga denoted a clan symbol. Each clan had its own Tamga. Outstanding individuals received the right to add their personal element to the clan Tamga. In the Genghis Khan Empire, the meaning of the word Tamgar expanded and became synonymous with the word seal. After that, they started calling Tamgars whatever documents with the Khan's seal on it, although the original meaning of the clan sign had remained. Sergei and Nikolai, bravo! You did it! Our archaeologists have found an image of morale and a clan Tamga nearby. They dated from the 3rd, 4th centuries BC. Apparently that was an interesting time, the dawn of the ancient Hellas, the rise of Rome. The Qing Empire flourished behind this mountain range, and powerful nomadic empires were forming on this side of the Jungar range. What an exciting work archaeologists have. New discoveries every day. I've been engaged in archaeology for about 15 years now. I graduated from history department with a major in archaeological history. Thanks to my wonderful occupation, it's so romantic. I was able to visit all parts of Kazakhstan, from the Rakhman Springs in the east to Dina Nupi Seva village in the west. I'm grateful to life that I'm an archaeologist and that my destiny allowed me meeting my wonderful colleagues. There are no random people in archaeology. As a rule, all relic hunters are extremely enthusiastic people. They did not leave their profession during the times hard for science and will never abandon their career no matter the difficulties. We love our work for the opportunities it gives us to travel and to discover. The mission of every archaeological expedition is someday to make a great archaeological discovery. That's why we don't stop. We keep on digging. We are just beginning our journey around Taldekorgan, but have already learned so much. We are very interested in the final results of the mound excavation. What new finds, discoveries and artifacts are awaiting the archaeologists? Yet it's time for us to continue on our way. For sure we will come back here sometime to learn more about the outcomes of this very interesting archaeological expedition. Our expedition is moving 70 kilometers in space and 1,000 years in time. We want to see a settlement on the outskirts of the village of Koilik. The first time I got to Koilik settlement 12 years ago. Academician Karl Moldakmetovich Baipakov, my teacher, showed it to me. Of course, the most interesting object here is the Buddhist temple, but to get to it, we need to walk over this field. Well, let's go then. The field is beautiful, although covered with water. How are we going to get there? Well, let's look for a ford. Coming closer to it, the field turned out not as gorgeous as it looked from afar. Too much water and dirt up to the knee. Rubber boots could save us. Well, a shallow pass must be somewhere. They just cannot walk on top of their seedbeds, right? 
What about trying here? Well, let's risk it. The road to the temple is not for everyone, especially these wearing regular shoes. Arman, was this roof here 12 years ago? No, it was all in open air. A significant part of Koinlik settlement is located amidst the development zone of the modern village. On its outskirts, they excavated fragments of the fortress walls and the remains of residential buildings. Koilik settlement is located on the territory of the modern village of the same name, about 150 kilometers away from the regional center of Taldekorgan. The site was nominated for listing in the World Cultural Heritage List and might become a great tourist attraction. For four centuries, the city of Koilik was the capital of the Kaluk state. It was the headquarters of the Kaluk Yabgu. The Kaluk state formed after the collapse of the Western Turkey Khaganate. It was a strategic location, as from here it was possible to control both the east of Kazakhstan and all of Jatesu. According to historian Lev Gumilev, the Kaluk genealogy goes back to one of the Turgesh branches, descendants of the Ashina clan. Another theory relates them to a more ancient Saka Thai people that nomadized between Lake Balkash and the Altai Mountains. In the 6th century, the Kaluks became part of the Turkic Khaganate. In the second half of the 8th century, after the collapse of the Khaganate, they established their own state that expanded up to the Serdarya River. The Kaluks played the decisive role in the war between the Arabs and the Chinese and captured Kashgaria. In the 9th century, they entered the Karakhanid Empire. According to the notes of the ambassador of Louis XI, Wilhelm Rubruck, the Kaluks were religiously tolerant. He described Muslim mosques, Buddhist temples and Nestorian churches on the premises of Koilik city. We are now at the ruins of the Buddhist temple. Manichaean temples of Koilik are also mentioned in literature. This teaching arose in the 3rd century in Persia and widely spread throughout Central Asia in the early Middle Ages. Manichaeism was a compilation of Christian and Zoroastrian religious canons with oriental mystical practices. Look, this burnt brick is like the one we saw in Sauran. During the invasion of Genghis Khan, Koilik was not destroyed because the Kaluks voluntarily obeyed Genghis Khan and became part of his empire. The city had existed until the 15th century. <coughs> From the village of Koilik, our expedition is heading to Matai Station. This is where we are supposed to meet the team of the Nomad Explorer Traveler community. We want to visit the Paradise Lakes. Many most mysterious and mystical rumors are associated with them.
following the highway, we covered the first 100 kilometers from Tal de Quagan to the Paradise Lakes quite quickly, but the last 50 kilometers were not as easy. Sand dunes resemble frozen waves in the ocean of sand. Desert climate is sharp continental, that is at night it's pretty cool and at noon the sun burns so hard that it's impossible to touch metal objects. Approaching the lakes, the vegetation changes. Saxol thickets get replaced with green chingill, tamarisk and poplar forests. As part of the route, we decided to drive to a location called the Paradise Lakes. They are stunning. I was here 13 years ago and decided to update my memories. The expedition has set up the camp in a picturesque poplar grove on the lake shore. The place turned out quite convenient. In the grove shade, it's not as hot and water is just a step away. I am engaged in the professional tourism business and as a rule, before coming somewhere with tourists, we do a reconnaissance mission. So my friends and I have come to a new location called the Paradise Lakes. Before bringing tourists here, we need to clean up the place. Fishermen, hunters, bird watchers and weekend tourists come here in different times of the year to enjoy the place. Unfortunately, not all of them are responsible and take their trash with them. As the tourist flow increases, it may become an issue. I just came from one of the lakes. There are dozens of them around. Geographically, we are about 30 kilometers away from Lake Balkash. We are on a several-day trip to the Jungarala town. We decided to see what the place is like. It turned out extremely interesting, although hard to reach. We made a small tour but couldn't get far, since the lake system is connected by canals and is overgrown with reeds. In the beginning of our journey, we saw the water of the Aksu River rotating the hydropower turbines near the village of Jansugirov. The same water goes through the foothills, crosses the desert sands and finally fills the lakes of this wonderful oasis. Floodplain ecosystems are an absolutely unique semi-aquatic world called the Two Guys in Central Asia. Waterfowl nests on the lakes and large mammals find refuge in dense floodplain woods. In the morning, these lakes are full of birds. There are thousands of them here. Judging by the signs we saw along the road yesterday, there are also roe deer and wild boars here. I also heard they have recently launched a project to restore the Balkash tiger population. Now the entire lake system is called the Paradise Lakes but the actual healing Paradise Lakes are a little further away, about 2-3 kilometers. It turns out that the name of this lake is not associated with the heavenly paradise, but with a certain Raya Appa who lived here and treated for various diseases. We cannot say from which exactly, but we'll definitely go for a swim and we'll tell you of the effect. The legend says that a woman called Rai Khan fell ill with leprosy. In those days, it couldn't be treated and in order not to infect her husband and children, the woman went away from the village. She walked for a long time and found herself on the shore of a salty lake. Rai Khan decided to drown herself. But drowning in a salt lake is not so easy as water pushes a person to the surface. 
A day after bathing the sores on the woman's body began to disappear and soon she was completely cured. There are thermal springs on the lake bottom. The water in it is warm and has a light hydrogen sulfide smell. Dear friends, we have seen historical monuments, crossed the desert and river floodplain, and now it's time for us to go up into the mountains to see the highest waterfall in Central Asia, which we will tell you about in the next episode of The Outdoor World.